Okay, let's look at the rules that are going to govern us while we're in this chapter running this particular hypothesis test. So for your null, you can have quite a few proportions you need to define. It depends on how many categories you have from your one categorical variable. And in the previous example, when we did type of nut, we had four categories. So you'll tell me what those null proportions will be equal to. And sometimes they're all equal to themselves. We'll do a couple of examples where that's the case. Um, and then you'll have the alternate. It's probably easiest to just write the null is not true. You can say that at least one of the proportions differs from the hypothesized value. So at least one of these proportions is incorrect in the null, but it's probably just simplest to write, hey, the null is not true. Whatever you're claiming, something's off. We won't be as specific as specific to say what is off. We'll just say something's off. All right, for assumptions, they totally change here. Well, not totally, but well, yeah, I, I should make my, my mouth stop talking right now. All right, we have that, like always, you have either a random sample or your sample represents your population. But the deal breaker looks completely different. So here we need all expected cell counts, all the NPs that we calculate to be at least five, meaning greater than or equal to five. So this right here is the deal breaker assumption. All right, if this one isn't met, we stop the problem. All right, because we can't get on the chi-squared distribution, we can't use chi-squared CDF. All right, we've already talked about our test statistic, right? It's gonna be observed minus expected squared over expected. I'm going to scooch this up just so we get the rest of, or as much as I can, of this stuff in view. Okay, so you're going to frequently see me write this. I'll write the sum of observed minus expected squared over expected. So I'll just use the abbreviations O and E for observed and expected. Okay, now this is what our typical chi-squared curve looks like. And I want to point out, they don't all look like this. Much like the T-curve, if you remember the T-curve, it looked like the standard normal, but every time your degree of freedom increased, the little tails on the T-curve went down and the peak went up, they all had slightly different shapes. Well, the chi-squared curve actually varies a lot more than even the T-curve. So this is your basic chi-squared curve, okay? And I'll, I'll talk about the variations on it when we get to this table here. But we will, for our p-value, we will find the area under the chi-squared curve to the right of the calculated chi-squared um, number that we got in step 10. We're always going to do a right-tailed test because chi-squared test statistics are always made to be positive, so we're always going to go to the right of that number. Now, I, I put a little note here that the degrees of freedom, all right, that's... Uh, the mean, which is the degrees of freedom, it, it occurs just to the right of the peak. So if this is the peak here, the mean of that curve is just to the right of it, and it's also the number of degrees of freedom. So whatever your, your value in step eight, when you're doing your 13-step write-up, that number will go just to the right of the peak here. And then again, this will be labeled with chi-squareds, right? And we'll have that number from step 10 here. We'll shade the area to the right, get a p-value, make sure that number matches my graph. All right, and then we're gonna make our decision. We'll either reject the null and have sufficient evidence for the alternate, or we'll fail to reject it and not have sufficient evidence. It's a good time just to remind you that these two write-ups are extremely similar. They differ by four words, right? When your p-value is greater than alpha, we tack on the words fail to here, and then do not here. Other than that, those write-ups are gonna be the same. All right, so let's take a look at all the, the various chi-squared curves. All right, so take a look at them. Now, it's, if you go to the, the electronic version of this, this is color-coded for you and it looks a lot prettier. It's not as nice when I print it in black and white, but how this works is this, this one right here, the lightest color coming down, or it's starting from the top here and heading down, that's when you only have one degree of freedom. Or another way of saying that is you only have two categories. All right, and you can see that actually doesn't look like one of these peaky type things, this skewed right graph here. Um, it looks more like a hyperbola if you've taken a math class. All right, and then as K, as we start our degrees of freedom increasing, right, as we bump up the number of categories we have, we go from this hyperbola looking thing to a different hyperbola looking thing, which is still a hyperbola looking thing. And if you don't know what a hyperbola is, don't fret too much, but I'll just give you a little summary. Hyperbolas in math, sometimes they look like this. They don't always look like that. 
and we'd only be looking at the right half, this one. Again, don't fret too much. I just want you to see it comes down here and gets asymptotically close to the x-axis. This one, it has a smaller peak, right? It's, it's not going all the way up here. It's coming in at 0.5, and it, it's still asymptotically getting closer to the x-axis. Once you get k equaling 3, once you have at least 3 degrees of freedom, then we start to get to something that looks more like our typically right skewed curve. So you can see it here, right? It's severely right skewed. Right? And all of these are right skewed. They're always right tailed tests. And then as the degrees of freedom increases, the skewing gets less and less severe. Right? And you can't see it as well here, but it's actually going to converge towards the normal curve. Eventually this will be a bell curve. It'll have a pretty far spread out x-axis, which we're not, I, I didn't, I couldn't get into view screen here. But I hope you see the idea. And, and if you don't, if you're like, oh my goodness, what are you talking about? Your calculator is going to help you graph it, for one, okay? And then even if not, if you just default to this basic chi-squared curve, you label it with chi-squared, you put your, your number from step 10 here, I'm, I'm going to be fine with it. So I don't want you to fret too much over what these look like. I just want you to hear that there is a lot of variability. They're not as... Um, uniform as the normal curves, right? They don't all look belly, like, like they start looking at like hyperbolas and then they kind of get into these other um, unimodal skewed right bumpy things. So I just want you to hear there's variability and these are what your chi-squared curves look like. All right, so with that, let's, let's work one of these from start to finish. Let's do a 13 step proof. I'll see you in a bit, bye. All right guys, let's try and run our first chi-squared test together. Uh, as I read this, be on the listen for what is the variable in this problem, right? We always want to start with what's the variable. So it says the number of defects from a manufacturing process by day of the week are as follows. So I see number of defects. I got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay. The manufacturer is concerned that the number of defects is greater on Mondays and Fridays is there sufficient evidence at the 5% level of significance that the proportion of defects is not the same each day of the week? Okay, so that's a lot to take in. Let's, let's start piecing together what on earth is the variable. First of all, I hope you see the word proportion. That's a great way to figure out that you're in proportion land. And if we think about what these numbers are representing, all right, these are frequency counts, right? So when you're talking about frequency counts, Anytime we have frequencies, we're going to turn them into relative frequencies or proportions when we divide by the sample size. So we are keeping track of the number of defects from a manufacturing process, right? So as soon as I see frequencies, I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna be some kind of proportion because I'm gonna convert them to relative frequencies. And really the variable here, if we think about what my variable is, it's the day of the week, right? I have a categorical variable. I am keeping track for every defect that was made. I am tracking it by assigning it a category. One, oh, excuse me, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. So as I move through this flow chart, right? I've read the problem. I've decided it's a categorical variable with five groups or five categories. There are five days of the week. Now, did I have one variable in this problem or did I have two variables in this problem? Right? And again, I only have the one variable. We're only keeping track of the days of the week. I'm not keeping track of which employee made it, um, if it happened more often in the nighttime or the daytime. It's just day of the week. I had one row of observed data. Right? So there was my observed data, all of these frequency counts. So let me just go make some notes to myself off in the margin. Right, so I know I'm in prop land. All right, there's my variable. Okay, I have five categories. So I know I'm gonna be running a chi-squared test. So that's just to help me get situated. All right, that's where I'm starting from. So let's, let's go take a look at this, right? So it says the manufacturer is concerned that the number of defects is greater on Mondays and Fridays all right, and wants us to test it at the 5% level that the proportion of defects is not the same each day of the week. So you hear not the same each day of the week. That's where the burden of proof is gonna fall, right? If the manufacturer is concerned that defects are more likely to occur on a Monday or a Friday, then that must be the, the hypothesis we put in the alternate, right? The, he's gonna assume everything's hunky-dory, 
unless we have enough evidence to show something's happening on Mondays and Fridays. And just taking a look at it, he might be right. He or she might be right as I'm looking at it. They, they do look like they have more defects on Mondays and Fridays, but how likely is that to happen just by chance? Okay, so we're trying to see if they're not the same each day of the week, right? If that's the alternate, then the null must have been that they are the same each day of the week. All right, now if they were the same each day of the week, imagine you have 100% of your defects that need to be distributed over these five days. So if I have five days and I need to distribute 100%, I'm gonna do 100 divided by five and find out that I should have about 20% per day, right? So if all things are created equal, 20% of my defects should happen on Monday, 20% on Tuesday, 20% on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And because I had five categories, right, if I take my 100% and I divide it by five, that would be 20% per day. Right? If everyone's working at the same quality level, regardless of whether it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, we should expect about 20% per day. All right, so that's the proportion I'm gonna put in the null. Now that runs very different to our first example. And when I say very different, here I gave you null proportions when we were doing the nut problem and they were all different. So I gave you the null proportions. Here it was implied. All right, and I'll refer back to that, but sometimes it's implied, sometimes it's not. When it's implied, take 100%, divide it by the number of categories and see what should be happening for each of those categories. All right, let's go. Step one, define some parameters. So I'm gonna define P sub M to be the true proportion of defects made on Monday. And then I need P sub T for Tuesday, W for Wednesday, I'll use R for Thursday, since I already used the T, and then I'll use Friday or F for Friday. So we have P sub T, P sub W, P sub R, P sub F, and I am lazy as I'll get out, so let's go ahead and start using quote marks. True proportion of defects made um, on, this would be Tuesday. This would be the true proportion of defects made on Wednesday. This is the true proportion of defects made on Thursday. And last but not least, this is the true proportion of defects made on Friday. Okay, got that. All right, so step two is to define our null. Now, I'm gonna push this up a little. All right, I'll keep my observed in view, but I just wanna give myself some more um, space to work. So for my null, I'm gonna assume that every day is the same as every other day, or every day is the same. So I'm gonna assume P sub M equals P sub T equals P sub W equals P sub R equals P sub F equals 0 0.20. All right, there was that implication that if, if all, things were, all days were created equal, then I would have 20% of my defects each day. Now again, the burden of proof falls on the manufacturer who thinks it might be more on Mondays and Fridays. So we're gonna put the alternate as H naught is not true, All right? Meaning that the proportion of defects is not the same each day of the week. All right, we won't go so far as to say which days have a greater likelihood of defects than others, but we're just gonna say it's not true in terms of the proportion of defects is not the same each day of the week. All right, for the alpha, I gave you a 5% alpha level. Okay, great. Let's go take a look at our assumptions. I'll put my assumptions up here so I use my space. So we'll go assumptions. All right, I would need a random sample and if I look through this, there was no mention of random sample. Okay, no problem, not the deal breaker. Okay, so I'll just put an X by it. All right, the next thing I need to do is calculate all of my expected counts. So let me get my expected Mondays. All right, it's always N times P. So we never got our total sample size as I look at this. I don't know how many defects they actually kept track of. So let's put our total out here. 
so we can see what we've got going on. All right, let me clear this out. We've got 36. Ooh, I'm gonna sneeze, hold up. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, 36, 23, 26, 25, and 40. It looks like we had 150 defects in our sample. So I have 150 times my null proportion of 0 0.20. It looks like I should have had 30 defects on Monday. Okay, so let's take a look. I, I expected 30 defects on Monday and I saw 36. So that's a difference of six. And six, relatively speaking, out of 30, eh, that's a chunk. But more than anything, it is greater than or equal to five. All right, my expected number of defects on Tuesday, also n times p. So this would be 150. And the null proportion for Tuesday was also 20%. So I'm getting 30 again. And let's take a look, right? I expected 30, but I observed 23. Well, that's a bit bigger, a little bit bigger of a discrepancy. That's off by seven, seven out of 30. Eh, we're getting close to a, a third being off. Uh, all right, expected for Wednesday. And I think you can almost start to see the pattern that the expected counts for all of the days are going to be 30. Right, so I could keep writing this out, but it's, it's always gonna be 30. And they're always gonna be greater than or equal to five. All right, and I could even go here and I say expected Friday, n times p equals 150 times, thir oops, not 30%, 20% from the null hypothesis. And that would be 30, which would be greater than or equal to five. So if you wanted to, you could write all of those out. I, I'm not actually going to do that. I'm gonna erase this and just so, show you how I would have written this, right? I, I wrote it out the long way just to show you how that could have looked. So feel free. But I'm gonna erase this because I wanna save some space. These problems are lengthy enough. Even erasing it takes a while. Maybe it wasn't worth it. All right, what I typically do is I would just say that the expected Mondays are the same as the expected Tuesdays, as Wednesdays, as Thursdays, as Fridays, and they are all NP, which is equal to 150 times 20%, which is 30, and they are all greater than or equal to five. So I would just write it up in one sentence. So when you have equality of the nulls, where the proportions are all the same, then you'll get the same expected counts. And again, I want to contrast that with example one. We had four different null proportions, right? We had 52%, 27%, 13%, 8%. And that's why we got four different expected numbers. Okay, so if you have different null proportions, you'll get different expected counts. If you have the same null proportions, you'll get the same expected counts. All right, so with that, let's move over to step six. Step six is to state the name of the distribution. You will always be on the chi-squared distribution. In terms of the test, we're gonna run the chi-squared goodness of fit test. And eventually you'll hear me re refer to it as the GOF test, because we look at that acronym, goodness of fit. All right, in terms of degrees of freedom, well, I had five different categories, one for each day of the week, so I have four degrees of freedom. So there's most of my setup. We're gonna go do the test statistic next. All right, test statistic with a formula and then with our numbers plugged in. Okay, so let's take a look. So as I move that up, all right, so, so for step nine, I'm gonna have that chi squared is always the sum of the observed minus the expected squared over the expected. Hey, now I told you, I'm super lazy. I don't like writing all this stuff out. So I'm gonna introduce you to something I call the plus dot, dot, dot method. Now this is not anything official, all right? So if you go ask people about the plus dot, dot, dot method, they're gonna think you're crazy. So here's what I mean. So for step 10, I start with the first category and I write up that contributor. So let's start with Monday. For Monday, I observed 36 defects. 
and I only expected 30. I'm going to square that number and I'm going to put it in ratio to 30. Okay, so I will always write the first contributor out. And then I'm going to do plus, dot, 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 and another plus sign. And I'm going to go to the last category. So my first category is Monday. My last category is going to be Friday. So on Friday, I observed 40 defects. I expected 30. I take that difference. I square it to make it positive. Turn it into a proportion. Okay. And so I have all of my contributors implied here. So write your first contributor and your last contributor, and then this plus dot, 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 it's a standard math notation where we just mean repeat that process for everything in between, okay? All right, so with that, let's do a figure out what this number is equal to. Now for the TI-83s, I'm gonna do this the long way because again, the TI-83s don't have this option of the goodness of fit test. And in a moment, I'll flip over to the calculator and I'll show you if you've got the TI-84, what you can do. All right, but for the TI-83s, here we go. So let's clear out our lists from before. All right, so let's go in here, oops, and put our observed. And then we'll put our expected. So you should have 30 written a whole bunch of times here. Now, I want to put, I, I want to make mention of something. I see this every semester where students will put the null proportions here. And I know why you're doing it, but your calculator will flip out and give you the wrong information. So these need to be frequency counts. They shouldn't be relative frequencies. All right, and I get that we have the proportions in the null hypothesis, but the way your calculator is set up, and this is true for the 83s or the 84s, these need to be the frequency counts. So they need to be the actual expected values. All right. So if you're with me on the TI-83, go over into L3, and here we go. We're going to write up our test statistic. So our test statistic always has the formula observed minus expected squared over expected. So I will define this to be my observed, which is an L1. I will leave out my expected, which is an L2, or subtract out, excuse me, square it, and divide it by L2. Okay? All right, before I tell you, what was the vocab term we assigned to all five of these numbers? Anyone remember? Started with a C, ended with an attributor. These are contributors, okay? So if I'm writing this up, I know this is now 1.2 plus dot, 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 plus we have, it looks like 3.3. And if I wanna figure out what that number ultimately is, I need to add these five contributors together. So I'm gonna go back to my home screen. I'm gonna hit second in stat. I'm going to go over to math. Option five is sum. I will sum out L3 and find out that my contributor, or excuse me, my chi-squared test statistic is 7.53. Okay. So if you're hanging with me on the TI-83s, you have to do this. You don't have an option. For some of us with the 84, in a moment, I'll show you how this can help you. Okay. So now we've got step 11 will be our p-value. All right, it will be a probability always. And when it comes to these probabilities, you owe me a letter, then you owe me a symbol, then you owe me a number. So our letter will be whatever letter we use in step six, it's chi-squared. Whenever you're running a chi-squared test, you're only gonna do the right tail. And whatever number you got in step 10, you should drop into step 11, okay? And then we're gonna run a chi-squared CDF. So we'll go chi-squared CDF, low, high, and then we need degrees of freedom. All right, we had four degrees of freedom. And even though we've only done the two examples, uh, your, your setup here, this second entry will always be positive infinity. It's just how the chi-squares work. Whatever number you got in step 10, positive infinity, whatever number you got in step eight. All right, let's see what our p-value is. So I'll hit second in bars. Wherever your calculator holds chi-squared CDF, and for the 83s, I think it's different than the 84s. Let's do this. So I'll take 7.53, or three, comma one, E99, and I had, I think it was four degrees of freedom. So it looks like my p-value is about 11%. All right, so for step 12, now again, if you have the 83s, your, your calculator will not help you through this part, unfortunately. If you have an 84, it will, 
or it might depending on how new and how old or how old yours is. But I want to do it the 83 way just so that we're all um, we're all seeing how the 83s would have to do it. So let me go get my ruler. All right, let's make our own little x axis. And again, this time would be the chi squared axis. Okay. So I'm going to make a little chi squared x axis. And I'm going to put a skewed right graph here. Now, this is not my best drawing, nor my worst, but I'm fine with it. All right, so here's what I'll be looking for on your graph. So your, your degrees of freedom is the number just to the right of the peak. So like here, ish, and just ish. And I need to go out to 7.53. So maybe 7.53 is about here, ish. And again, this doesn't have to be exact, but I have a right tailed test. So I need to shade the area to the right of my test statistic. All right, and could this be about 11% that I shaded? It could be. All right, that's not, like I said, it's, it's close enough. It's not like I got uh, under 50% here, but over 50% here. This shading could match that 11%. All right, so then we have to decide, am I going to reject or am I going to fail to reject? And again, because our p-value is greater than alpha, we're going to fail to reject. All right, so because our p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject h naught. All right, that means we do not have sufficient evidence. All right, let's see what we do not have sufficient evidence for. I'm gonna go back down and use the words that they gave me. So I do not have sufficient evidence that the proportion of defects is not the same each day of the week. So I'm gonna take this phrasing and just copy it. All right, so we do not have sufficient evidence that the proportion of defects is not the same each day of the week. Or you could say we do not have sufficient evidence that the number of defects is greater on Mondays and Fridays. You could also write it that way. So let me, I'll, I'll put both write-ups in there just so we have a couple of options. All right, so let's try this. So we do not have sufficient evidence that the proportion of defects is not the same each day of the week. Or we could have said, if I wanted, here is an alternate of my alter, uh, of my of my write-up. We do not have sufficient evidence that the number of defects is greater on Mondays and Fridays. Okay, so you got a couple of write-ups. Pick one you like. I'm good with either one. All right, and just before we flip over to the calculator version, I really want to point out again the, the difference between how we ran this, this example and how we ran example one. So if we look back at example one, I really want to stress here that we had four different null proportions all right, that were given to you, and you had four different expected counts. You still had to calculate them, but notice, right, 78 is different from 40.5, is different from 19.5 is different from 12. All right, and we couldn't even see it in a different view. If we remind ourselves what the second page of this packet looked like, four different null proportions, right? Four different expected counts. Okay, fine, that is one version of this problem. There will be plenty of chi-squared goodness of fits where your nulls have different proportions in them. But we also just introduced ourselves to this version. And when I say this version, I say we had implied equality on those nulls. And how we got this 
was we took our overall 100%, right? Because any distribution has to have 100% of your data accounted for. And we divided it by five because there were five categories. And it just happens that 100 divides in, or five divides into 100 nicely and you get 20%. And that's where I was getting this 20% number. And when you have equality in the nulls, all right, and when I say equality in the nulls, all of the null proportions are equal to each other. They're not only equal to a number, they're equal to each other. They were all equal to 20. All right, then you're gonna have the same expected counts for each of them. So we've got two different types of problems we're seeing. Again, the first one, we had different null proportions and that produced different expected counts. In example two, this one, we had the same null proportions and that produced the same expected counts. Okay, all right, so with that, we're going to take a look now at your graphing calculator and I'm going to show you, for those of you who have the TI-84, um, just a different option for, for getting all of this information. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Hey Math43, let's take a look at how the TI-84s can do the chi-square Goff test. Now, none of the TI-83s to my knowledge can do it and most of the TI-84s can. I hope yours can. If it can't, go ahead and use that TI-83 method that I was showing um, in the first part of this video. But for those of us who do have the Goff test, it does make it easier. So what you gotta do, you gotta go into your lists, right? and we gotta put our observed into L1 and then our expected into L2. So basically we're putting our frequencies in L1 and whatever we expect, the n times p's into L2. So let's look at our frequency counts, what, 30, 60 effects Monday, 23 on Tuesday, 26 Wednesday, is that going in? Enter. There we go. 25 and 40. And I expected if we were making the same number of defects each day, then out of those 150 defects, I should have made about 30 per day if all things were the same. Okay. So once we get in there, instead of having to do that L2 minus L1 squared divided by L1, Watch and learn, guys. All right, so we'll hit stat. We'll go over to tests. Now, we're so far down on this list, it's actually easier to scroll up. And check and see if you have this option in your calculator. So all of us have a chi-squared test, and that'll be a little bit later on in the chapter when we do something called the chi-squared test for independence. We all have that. But take a look and see if you have something called the GOF, the goodness of fit test. If you do, count yourself lucky. If you don't, ooh, we gotta suck it up and do it the TI-83 way. So here we go. We typically put our observed data, our frequency counts into L1. Our expected counts are in L2. And you need to actually type in your degrees of freedom. And again, for chi-squared land, degrees of freedom aren't sample size minus one. It's number of categories minus one. I had five days of the week, so I have four degrees of freedom. I have the option for calculator draw. Let's hit calculate for this first one. And there you can see, there's your test statistic. And if I scroll up here, right, there's our pretty little test statistic that we got. There's our p-value of 11%. We got that also using chi-squared CDF. We knew our degrees of freedom were four. And if you see this, this, this acronym, CNTRB, that stands for contributor. And if you scroll left or right, you can see those contributors. This has a severe round off error, so I gotta scroll past it. Here comes our next contributor, a lot of round off error here. And then wait for it. Wait, I don't know how many times I hit this, but it'll scroll through all of those contributors should you want to see them. Oh, it's just gonna keep going. All right, and we got those in our L3 um, when we did L1 minus L, excuse me, L2 minus L1 squared divided by L2. So you see the, the notes for how you could do it the TI-83 method, but this, this is faster. Now I also wanna go through here and just draw. So I make sure that I have, wait for it, okay, the correct graph. Because there are times when your chi-squared test looks more like a hyperbola, and here it's that, that severely right skewed, I mean they're always right skewed, but it's got that, that unimodal um, look to it. So there's my chi-squared graph and I, I just copied, I took a screenshot of this and put it on my write-up. But you see me putting my test statistic from step 10 here. Right? I'm labeling it as chi-squared and I had about 11% of the area under my curve. So here's the top 11%. This would have been the bottom, what, uh, I can do the math, 
So there's your look at a uh, chi-squared Goff test. It's awesome, right? So your calculator can do that. And why I think it's a good idea to draw is, yes, most chi-squared curves look something like this. But as I mentioned before, and here's the, the nice in-color version of this, some of them look more like hyperbolas. They just come scrolling down from the top of, well, the top of your, your probabilities on the y-axis. And then that peak gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it finally gets down into this corner. And then they just become a little bit more spread out and more spread out. Believe it or not, they eventually look like the normal curve. All right, so with that, uh, we're going to take a look at some multiple choice questions. I'll see you in a bit. Bye.